This morning, I'm in Williamsburg, Virginia, talking with Linda K. Tessar, who is the head of technical services and special collections at the Wolf Law Library of William and Mary University's Law School. In fact, Linda, I note that we are taking, uh, we're using the special room for which you are responsible as um, head of special collections. Uh, yes. We're doing this uh, session in, in that this morning. And it's in fact the same one that I uh, was able to uh, uh, do a session like this with Jim a while back, uh, your yes. director, Jim Hiller. So it's a, kind of a treat yes. to be in here. It's a, a very special room. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're shooting it in the one part where I do not have to worry about reflecting light off of the uh, uh, glass cases and stuff, but the books in here are very impressive to see indeed. Oh, well, thank you. Yes. It's something I'm very proud of. Yeah. Well, you also have a very special collection of all sort of digitalized over here. Yes. Um, uh, yes. Tell me a little tiny bit about that. Well, We're sort of off our normal script a tiny bit. That's wow. okay. The room we're in is the George With room. Uh, it's a George With collection. George With was our first law professor. He taught John Marshall and Thomas Jefferson. Uh, he was the first law professor in the country, actually. And we decided we would create this room that would recreate his library. Uh, Jim Heller and Kevin Butterfield, my predecessor, are the people who started working on the collection. Mm -hmm. And when I got here seven years ago, it was a project that I also started working on and we greatly expanded it. I took a course with Warren Billings um, and did some research with him mm -hmm. and got some guidance. And luckily a publication came out actually that some historians had found uh, Thomas Jefferson, a, a letter that Thomas Jefferson had written, a, actually a list of what he did with the books that he received from George Wythe, with mm -hmm. bequeathed all of his books to Thomas Jefferson. Jeff Jefferson was like a second son to him. Mm -hmm. um, well, actually an only son. George Wythe didn't have any children. So uh, that was discovered in 2008. I saw the publication in 2009. So that expanded the number of books that are that we knew that he may have had and we created we created the collection and decided to create this room and to go with the room we created uh, an online resource we call Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a pun on Wikipedia but it's scholarly. How did I guess? <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's scholarly whereas one could argue that Wikipedia is perhaps not. So uh, I guess we won't go there. We won't go there. <laughs> uh, Jim and I vet every single page that goes in. We have pages that discover that discuss all of the books. We have pages that discuss um, with various students uh, some other information about with, including his um, murder by arsenic. But I won't go into that. Uh, <laughs> So um, it's something I'm very proud of. It's probably the thing that when my career is over, and I never would have guessed that this would be the thing I would be the most proud of, but I've, I've written a couple of articles about George Wythe. Uh, there's one coming out in a book of Virginia historians mm -hmm. uh, later this year. So it's actually, George Wythe is sort of the thing, I guess, that I gained by moving to Virginia. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, Warren Billings a few minutes ago, and, and uh, you know he is uh, just for the reader's benefit uh, or viewer's benefit. Uh, he is actually the uh, husband of our um, of um, Carol Billings, who was the law librarian of Louisiana for many years. She's a former president of AALL, and they live here in Williamsburg in portions of the year. Uh, uh, and down in uh, New Orleans, where he's on faculty in some fashion still at, uh, at one of the schools, the University of uh, New Orleans, I believe. Or... Yes. He also uh, teaches a course every spring mm -hmm. here at uh, the law school at William & Mary yeah. on legal history. Yeah. So he comes up in the spring when it's really the nicest weather here. Yes. Very well planned, I think. Well, he has to be here for the winter, which maybe is... It's more mild than some places. Yeah. 
Well, Williamsburg is, it has a nice climate, actually. It gets a little hot and humid in the summer. But it does. That's true of the whole East Coast. That's the true. United States, sure. Well, even though we have sort of deviated from our normal script at this point, uh, Linda, I want to sort of return and sort of, as is our custom, ask a little bit about you as a person, a human being, as opposed to just a colleague that we all know from, you know, professional things. Could you tell us a little bit about your life, and not only perhaps today, but even when you were younger? Okay. Um, I was born in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. I grew up mainly in Tennessee. We moved to Tennessee when I was six. Um, most of my... Um, we moved to Clarksville, Tennessee when I was in the eighth grade, mm -hmm. and I went to college in Clarksville, Tennessee. Unfortunately, nobody at the time, not my parents, not my guidance counselors, ever suggested I should even consider a different college, so I just went to the local one. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where I got my bachelor's in history, mm -hmm. and I guess the thing that stands out in, the, as I was thinking about this interview, the thing that stands out in my history, even starting when I was a younger person and a teenager is I actually had a love of history from the very beginning. I started, uh, I believe, the Masterpiece Theater production of Henry the Six, Henry's Six Wives um, and the following one of Elizabeth I is what really turned me on to history. And if you, uh -huh. if you were to see my office now, you would see that it's somewhat tongue-in-cheek decorated in Henry the Eighth and the Six Wives. I have several different mm -hmm. collections of them. And it's just sort of an, an homage to my younger person, my younger self, because that's always been a part of who I was. Uh, and I, I loved Thomas Jefferson growing up. He was my hero. Moving here to Virginia, I've learned a little bit more about him, and now George Wythe is my hero, but I think that would be mostly okay with Thomas Jefferson. Um, other than that, uh, Currently, I, I do a lot of pottery. I, I started taking pottery when I moved here. Mm -hmm. So I create pottery and I do a lot of gardening. I'm trying to create an English garden in the house that I live in now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, here in Williamsburg or nearby, there is a place that sells pottery called the Pottery. Yes, there is. And they sell a lot of other stuff. They, they do. Probably about, well, I'm afraid, about 30 years ago when our kids were young, uh, we came down from D.C. Uh, area, we were living up there, and among other things, uh, went out there, and my late wife had a grand time selecting uh, uh, items for the house, you know, to sort of make it look sort of different and special for uh, from the pottery, and we also went around and found uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, artificial plants, some of which I still have oh my in my goodness. house out on the west coast where I live. And uh, yeah, they're in pretty good shapes. Well, maybe the, I think they're in pretty good shape, maybe they're not, but uh, uh, quite a while. And, and they add, you know, a type of uh, decor that my two cats do not eat. So uh, if I use the real plants, I think they would be gardening all the time, those kitties. <laughs> I have the same problem. Yes. So you've mentioned uh, a hobby. Uh, uh, did you have any other special passions or anything that uh, occupied time or I interest still, you? I still read a lot of English history. Mm -hmm. um, I read fantasy as well. Mm -hmm. um, Nothing wrong with that. Well, I don't think so because I like reading it well, too. It's, it's not scholarly. Uh, uh, yes. But um, I listen to books a lot. I started listening to books on um, Audible, actually, uh -huh. when I was commuting from my house outside of Nashville into Nashville uh, when I was working at Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. And I, I now listen to books while I'm doing almost everything, when I'm cleaning my house, when I'm doing the garden. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds all very fascinating. I assume you still watch Masterpiece Theater. I do I, still watch Masterpiece yes, Theater. Yes, I mean, the, the Six Wives of Henry VIII was on a few years back, but uh, Downton Abbey has just wrapped up this last year, so we're all in mourning over that. We yes. love to have more episodes, but uh, they'll come up, I'm sure, with something most interesting and pleasant to watch. I particularly like whatever his. I love history, so... Yeah. 
the historical ones are the ones I like the best. I, I do watch some of the others. I like the Sherlock series as well. Oh, yeah. But um, the costume dramas are the ones that really grab my attention. It is sort of interesting to. I don't, you know, with anything on television or in the theaters, you can't be absolutely sure of the authenticity of everything that you see, both as to content and, and style, but it, they make nice, nice uh, entertainment, I think. Yes. Yeah. Well, maybe we should move on to you as a law librarian. Uh, could I ask about your uh, education? Uh, I understand uh, from my background, uh, search on you before we I came this morning you have three degrees. Can you tell us what they are and where you got each? Um, yes, I do have three degrees. I have a master's in history, no, I'm sorry, a bachelor's in history uh -huh. from Austin Peay State University. My main concentration there was English history and early American history. Mm -hmm. I then went to Vanderbilt University and have a master's in art history. Mm -hmm. uh, focusing mainly on early American modernism and French Impressionism. While I was working on my master's for art history, I decided, oh, wouldn't it be a great idea to become an art librarian? Mm -hmm. Because I had worked both at Austin P and at Vanderbilt in the slide library, and I'd always liked libraries. I liked to read. Mm -hmm. Isn't that why people become librarians? So. I went to George Peabody College of Vanderbilt for my library degree. Mm -hmm. And the whole plan, as you can tell from where my career ended up, was for me to be an art librarian. But what happened was I graduated with my degree and decided that I wanted to stay in Nashville. Most of my family is still in the Nashville area. Mm -hmm. And the only jobs that were open at the time, actually there was one for an art librarian, and it was at one of the local art museums. And then there was also a job open at the Eileen Queener Massey Law Library at Vanderbilt mm -hmm. for a cataloger. Mm -hmm. Well, the difference in pay was about <laughs> $10,000 at a time when that was nearly... Well, I've heard about starving artists, 40 but that's a bit too much. 40% <laughs> of the salary. It was huge. Yeah. So I applied for the one at Vanderbilt. Uh, luckily, they hired me. And suddenly, I found myself as a law librarian and a cataloger, neither of which I had actually really studied to be. I thought I was going to be an art reference librarian. <laughs> or hoped. <laughs> I, but as it turned out, uh, law has a lot to do with history, and mm -hmm. history has always, as I said, been that underlying theme. So it, it seemed a natural fit, because cataloging is figuring out puzzles to me, so that's also something that I enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. So it, it became a natural uh, choice, and I actually really only one or two times did I think, oh, I should try to get out of this and get back into art librarianship. I just decided that this was where I needed to be. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you talk about history and art, and we're surrounded by some art in a very special form, some of the older books with the uh, engravings and so on in them. You have several on display, actually, uh, showing some of that in them. and. Uh, History-wise, you mentioned Thomas Jefferson as being a protege of uh, uh, the sort of the founder here at the school. And the other day I was in Boston talking with Robert Brink, who was the executive director of the Social Law Library uh, up, in, up there. And he was talking about uh, the controversies and the sort of the final decision made early on. Uh, Jefferson and some of the others, the Federalists primarily, uh, on the other side, were vying to influence how the American legal system would develop. Uh, this is you know, just a few years after the uh, War for Independence. And Jefferson took the approach, among, and others, that we had just gotten rid of the Brits and uh, we would, you know, the French had been our allies of sorts during the war. And so we would sort of model our uh, legal system uh, after the uh, civil law system is, is used in countries such as France. And as we all both know, they didn't prevail. But, no. Uh, 
that we use. Uh, people, the judges and others, were still using the old-fashioned uh, approach called common law, <laughs> and that's what finally uh, uh, became the norm in almost all parts of this country. I think Louisiana is a civil law jurisdiction still, but everybody, all the rest of us are common law. Well, Thomas Jefferson was joined in that by George Wythe. Uh, uh -huh. He actually became a Chancery Court judge, mm. which is much more dependent upon civil law than common law, uh -huh. and tried his best to get rid of common law in his decision. So, yes. Um, well, you know, one could argue one system or the other, and, you know, compared to the politics that we're in today, this is uh, 2016, and we're in the middle of a rather uh, interesting and unusual kind of presidential uh, campaign for uh, election of the president. And uh, uh, what they were doing then was probably every bit as important to them as this is to a lot of people today, but uh, probably tamer and more, uh, uh, should we say, civilized in the way they are. I hope so. <laughs> at least I think so. I don't think they were out shooting each other in duels or anything at that point. Uh, although I, I don't believe that any of that's been done lately either here. <laughs> um, well, you know, you already sort of mentioned how it was you ended up in law libraries, and I would, uh, um, you know, could have had other reasons, others that somebody could have influenced you, but it sounds like you kind of uh, made the financial decision that was prudent, and uh, there you were. There uh, I was. Yeah. Do you count anybody uh, in your formative years as a mentor, or maybe more than one? Um, I've thought about this a lot, and I think that one of my colleagues at Vanderbilt, Annabelle Leiserson, mm -hmm. was instrumental in helping me get involved with AAAL. It took a little while. Uh, when I first got to Vanderbilt, I mainly focused on being my title was technical services and systems librarian. Mm -hmm. So I was the systems, uh, I didn't actually do anything in the back end of the system, but I was the systems liaison with the main library and the systems office on campus. So I did a lot of things with law users groups for mm -hmm. the various systems, for Notice and then for, for Searcy. Mm -hmm. And I was part of the overall campus team that implemented the change from notice to Cersei. So I spent a lot of time doing that. But Annabelle is actually the one who invited me to be part of, we were co-editors of the Technical Services Law Librarian for three years together. Mm -hmm. And it was her idea that I would be part of that. So that actually helped move me along um, into more of the association because at that point, I really hadn't been that involved. Mm -hmm. uh, I think other people who were probably formative, I remember going to my first uh, AAA conference, which was in Reno. <laughs> oh, yes, I remember that one. The where, infamous Reno. Where the president uh, of our association stepped out of the stagecoach into some rather muddy <laughs> ground. <laughs> it, was, it was very interesting. Um, we actually, on, I went to Connell, mm -hmm. and we drove, by, we drove by brothel, which was... Yes, there are a few in that state. It was, it was um, a sight to see. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I trust from the road. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we didn't stop. But we did stop at a, a um, village, an old time sort of, uh, I guess, gold rush town. Yeah. Which, That's right, they had gold and silver. Was, in fact, I think the state talk, still calls itself the Silver State or something. I think you're right. Yeah. Um, so that was interesting. And on the Connell trip, I met uh, Pat Callahan from the University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And she was always someone, and some, some of the other University of Pennsylvania people were always people I hooked up with when I went to, to the conference. So. Not a, a tremendous hands-on uh, mentor, mm -hmm. but I also would say that the directors I've worked with uh, have been very encouraging and have pushed my career along a little bit, uh, particularly Pauline Aranis and Martin mm -hmm. Surgeon at Vanderbilt, and of course, uh, Jim Heller is a force of nature. Yeah. And the reason, really, that I started publishing 
I really hadn't published before I got to William and Mary, and mm. I've actually published three things now, which is kind of astonishing to me. It was not something I really thought about when I was at Vanderbilt. There were one or two things. Or when you were thinking of being an art history library. No, actually it wasn't, <laughs> but um, Jim has been, in his own way, uh, a mentor to my later career, I suppose. Well, that's great. I, I, of course, Jim is a very good friend of mine. I, I think he is. I, I, I consider him a great friend. I think it's a reciprocal. And, uh, I've watched him uh, develop this library over some years. And, uh, it's really uh, become a very impressive operation. He's done a really good job. Yeah. I, like every director, or many directors, I did a lot of uh, site inspections for accreditation over the years, and one of them was down here. And I remember going out into the library, and there was this uh, student at a Carroll working online with uh, her um, then laptop computer and accessing databases, and I didn't see any wiring or anything, except maybe a plug for the computer, um, but not a, a data port or anything like that. And I started asking her, well, um, what, how are you accessing that? It was something called Wi-Fi. It was relatively new. And, uh, of course, I, I watched, and she gave me a, a nice little demo of how it worked. And so when I got back to my own shop up in uh, Washington, D.C. in America, and I uh, immediately told the dean about this, and uh, we, you know, he had our technical people start looking into it very quickly, and we had been wiring more and more of the uh, seats in the, in the library and in the classrooms with data ports, you know, Ethernet connections. And we, after that, we, you know, we put in Wi-Fi. I'm sure we would have gotten it anyhow, but uh, it was one of those things, you know, when you do visits in, of any sort to a place, you always like to see what they're doing and see all the best ideas. <laughs> so I did. So that was uh, another thing here. Uh, Jim was uh, in the library, a little bit ahead of the curve for where we were at the time. He likes to be ahead of the curve. Yeah, well, why not? Yeah. Well, you were at uh, Vanderbilt for uh, 21 years, I think. Yes. And then uh, in 2009 is when you came here to the Wolf Law Library. Um, you want to talk about uh, some of that, how it maybe came about, or, you know, I don't want you to give away trade secrets. Oh, no. Um, well, I, was, I actually assumed that I would stay at Vanderbilt my entire career. I really wasn't looking to be... To move up, I was happy where I was. My family lived nearby. Mm -hmm. I had a project there that I was working on that I think they're finally getting off the, they're finally going to release to the public at some point. Uh, I was working on a project to digitize the Hugh C. Anderson papers. He was uh, a court of appeals judge mm -hmm. in Tennessee and the presiding justice at the Nuremberg Krupp trial. Oh. And we had all of his papers, his family had given them to Vanderbilt. And we digitized the trial transcripts and his personal papers. And just never, we had them online, parts of them online for a little while. Then the university changed to a different web interface. And so we had to put everything through a different program and we were going to have to rebuild all of it. And time just got away, and I never really had time to uh, finish that. But I believe they're finishing that at Vanderbilt. Okay. So you had your day job still. <laughs> uh, yes. I had to do that yes. first. Um, unfortunately, yes. And electronic resources had sort of mushroomed, and I was in charge at Vanderbilt of doing those for the law library. Mm -hmm. But this job came open in the spring of 2009, and my predecessor, Kevin Butterfield, had known that I had thought about applying for it when he got it. I told him, oh yeah, I thought about it. It was one of only a couple of places that I actually would have considered mm -hmm. to go to, to leave Nashville. I'm pretty much, a, I don't know that I'm a southern girl, so to speak, but I like being warm. Yeah. So there are I thought more or less that there was nothing above the Tennessee border. You could take that straight across. 
that I would actually have considered. Uh, you mean you're afraid to go much farther north? You'll have nothing but snow and ice. For I just don't like snow. I don't like snow and ice. Yes. Um, I might have thought about going back to Tennessee, to Missouri, to St. Louis, just because of my heritage. My family was from there. My dad. I grew up listening to stories about the St. Louis Cardinals and. I actually have a bobblehead in my office, a stand usual. Ah. So I had actually thought about St. Louis, but when this job came up, and I did notice that Williamsburg is just a little bit north of what would have been the Tennessee mm -hmm. state line going across. And it's south of the Mason Dixon line. Well, that's so, and so is Maryland. I think they're all Yankees up there. I actually <laughs> thought about using the Mason Dixon line as my line of demarcation, but it's way too far north. It's it's way too cold. It is a bit uh, farther north. Yeah, I thought I thought it was lower than it actually is. But um, Williamsburg, the colonial Williamsburg, was a was a draw mm -hmm. because it's the time period of American history that I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. uh, I lived in uh, Tennessee for most of my life, and they celebrate a particular war that. Virginia also does have to acknowledge the, the late unpleasantness. The the war of northern aggression, I believe. Was oh, that how they? Because I've heard I it believe, called that uh, too. <laughs> yes, I believe some people refer to it as that. And here in Colonial Williamsburg, they talk about a better war, at least in my opinion, one that's more interesting, one that in which. <laughs> we all won. <laughs> we won, and and it's also. Uh, even though I like English history, obviously I'm very proud to be an American, and so uh, that was a draw to That's come great. here. If Homeland Security watches, this video, <laughs> they won't be coming around to check up on you. So. Well, I don't only want to become a British citizen. I think that would be okay. I think we still like them at least this week. Well, let's hope so. <laughs> Well, so it sounds like you had some interesting reasons for coming here to uh, Virginia, uh, which is, as far as I know, fairly southern. Uh, I go out and order iced tea. Uh, be careful uh, how much sugar they're putting in it. We're, we're far enough south for that. Yes. And uh, other characteristics. But it is a very pleasant part of the country, I, I've always thought, uh, having lived you know, about three hours from here up in the D.C. area. Uh, for a long time. I won't uh, bore everybody more with that, but uh, we'd come down here occasionally. It was a lot of fun. Well, it's also very green. Mm -hmm. um, there are there are parts of moving here that I didn't realize I was, there are benefits to moving here that I didn't realize I was going to, to get. But Virginia has done a very good job of creating bicycle trails. Oh. And I, ju I didn't know this at the time that I bought the house I'm living in, but I am a mile from what's called the Virginia Capitol Trail. There's a trail from Jamestown Island mm -hmm. all the way up to Richmond wow. that is devoted to bicycles or walking if you wanted to do that. And I've taken many trips from my house to Jamestown Island and taken the bicycle around the island. I've gone about 14 miles, 15 miles, so it's a round trip. Uh, of about 28 mm -hmm. up toward Richmond. I don't know that I'll ever actually make it all the way to Richmond because that's 45 or 50 miles and mm -hmm. I don't know that I want to may have to come back. may surprise yourself. Who knows? It, it's a goal. Yeah. It's a goal, but uh, that's one of the things I did not realize that was here in Virginia and it's mm -hmm. flatter, at least this part of Virginia is flatter than Middle Tennessee, um, it was harder to ride a bicycle yeah. in the Nashville and surrounding yeah, areas. You have to go up quite a ways beyond Richmond before you have to worry about, should we say, hills. They're called yes. the Appalachians. <laughs> yes, the slight hills. <laughs> yes. Well, it sounds like you uh, have had a, a good experience here just in the few years you've been here. Well, it's not quite a few. You know, it's been not a decade, but getting up on there. Getting there. Yeah. Well, you've also uh, done a few other things outside of the library. You've already alluded to some of your publications, but before we talk a little bit about those, let's talk about some of your professional service. Uh, I noticed that, among other things, you uh, served at one point as treasurer of the Technical Services Special Interest Section of AALL, and then uh, became the chair of that section. Um, and you've been chair of AALL's Placement Committee, and. Uh, 
the treasurer of the Virginia Association of Law Libraries. I think everybody I've known has been in that group has really enjoyed all the people they, they meet there. Um, you want to talk a little bit about some of your professional service and maybe tell us uh, a little bit of why you, you take time out of your otherwise fairly busy life to uh, be involved. Well, I think it's really important to be involved for a couple of reasons. I've found it most rewarding to be involved with uh, the technical services special intersection. I'm also a member of the online bibliographic special intersection. And now that I'm here at William and Mary and can claim a reason, I'm involved in the legal history of her books special intersection. But I think the thing that I like, the thing that draws me to these groups is that this is the way to connect with people. Otherwise, I, I think that we're isolated and we don't know what's going on in our profession. Mm -hmm. And I think that the more we can be active in these organizations, we can work together to do things, particularly with the technical services group, uh, changes in cataloging rules and they actually, I think I started in, when I started in 1988, the rules were AACR, I think, mm -hmm. and then we went to AACR2 and now we're at RDA. Um, and so there's been this progression and there's always been this group where you could rely upon help to figure out what was going on if you had a question, I don't know how to do this, then because of my involvement in the greater organization, I knew people that I could ask, how do I do this? Mm -hmm. So I think that that's, and I've developed some of the strongest friendships of my professional life, actually with people who, with whom I don't work, but I visit every time I go to AA -L. That's Actually, the programming is, is great sometimes for TS librarians, maybe not as much as it used to be. Mm -hmm. But the reason I go is more to see the people that I have missed all year and want to see again. Yeah. I, I found that same experience to be you know, one of the main purposes of my attending. It was uh, to see and meet more people. And, uh, and then have friends that, with whom I could ask questions, just as you say. And in today's world, you know, in the old days, we'd have to pick up the telephone, and it could be a pretty pricey to call long distance in those days. Now you could send them a tweet or whatever, however means you want to use. Uh, it's so much easier. Um, but that, you know, I, I agree with you. This is the main purpose of a professional activity is to uh, meet and work with these wonderful colleagues we have. I agree. Yeah. Now you've gone beyond professional association sorts of things and you've done some writing. Uh, you mentioned it a few minutes ago. Uh, you want to talk a little, a little bit about that? Well, um, I actually uh, wrote the first article on the creation of the George With Library because George With didn't leave any papers behind. He didn't he was unlike his student, Thomas Jefferson, who left all kinds of things and, and different catalogs for different time periods in his life. Um, George Wythe didn't leave personal papers, so we didn't really know what books he had. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that there was the discovery of the list that Thomas Jefferson got of the books that he received from George Wythe. And there are other bibliographies that have been created over the years. So my first article was about that, and it actually got published in um, LLJ, uh, and it won the Call for Papers Award the year mm -hmm. that I submitted it. Uh, more recently, I've been asked to, I had to write an article about uh, George Wythe and teaching of Roman law in Williamsburg, which was challenging, because there really isn't any, um, evidence that he actually did that but it was for <laughs> it was for publication that was celebrating uh, Matilda of Canosa I believe and it was focusing on Roman law because she helped uh, it, she was instrumental in having the pandex mm -hmm. uh, translated or um, discovered, I, I can't remember exactly her role in that, and George Wythe was part of it for the Williamsburg mm -hmm. exhibition. 
Uh, the most recent thing that I've written was more on how George Wythe was not merely a legal scholar, he was also a Greek and Latin scholar. Mm -hmm. A lot of the books that you can't see that are on this side of the room are Greek and Latin originals. Mm -hmm. He had, well, originals of their time period, obviously nothing from Greek and Roman times. But he read Cicero, he read Homer, he had maybe 10 different copies of things by Homer, he had Horace, uh, he, he just had this whole array of things. He was also interested in science. We have um, a couple of books on science back in the back. Um, so that's what the most recent thing. And I should mention that the person who really got me, keeps getting me to write these things is Warren Billings again. Mm -hmm. I probably I didn't mention him as a mentor earlier, but in every way possible he has been for the writing process for me. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that counts very much. Uh, he doesn't have to be another law librarian, although Warren's been around uh, our association so long, I think he's an honorary <laughs> law librarian. I actually think um, he considers himself almost more at home with the law librarians than with any other group. Yeah. Well, uh, he's been a lot of fun to uh, know over the years, and of course, uh, Carol, his wife, as well. Yes, I love Carol. She's wonderful. Well, it sounds like you've had sort of an interesting career throughout, and it evolves and becomes even more interesting in some ways as you uh, proceed. And now with the writings and some of the work you're doing here. Um, I think that the thing I like about my career the most is the fact that it has evolved. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I suffer from ADHD or some sort of, <laughs> uh, it's possible, but I, I like having things, I like different things, I like things evolving. I don't think that I would still want to be a cataloger, although I enjoyed mm -hmm. that while I did it. I, I do think the, the constant, mm -hmm. gradual change of doing different things. Right now, our library is going through a, a change, once again, from, a, from one online system library catalog to another one. And I'm deeply involved with that, which has been really interesting. Unfortunately, it takes my, way, my attention away from George Wythe, and I want to get that back. But um, I, You I, probably I, will. Oh, I intend to. But I think that the fact that things change and evolve is also, there's a lot of opportunities. I have to be, I have to say I've, I've been very fortunate in the fact that I've had multiple opportunities that I would not necessarily have expected from the beginning of my career. Well, that sounds like a, uh, you've had a fascinating and stimulating time and refreshes itself periodically so you're not doing the same old, same old uh, stuff all the time. That's nice. Uh, I envy that, uh, just thinking about it. <laughs> and yet mine was somewhat the same. I, I, it wasn't the same from one end to the other in a lot of ways in my career. Yeah. Well, maybe on that, uh, we're sort of nearing the end of today's conversation for the history. Uh, but before we do, it's customary to ask if there's anything we haven't talked about that you would like to mention. I can't think of anything mm -hmm. other than to say that I've worked with some wonderful colleagues, mm -hmm. uh, both here and in Vanderbilt, and that I'm grateful for the opportunities that I've been given. Well, with that said, uh, Linda Tessar, uh, I want to thank you on behalf of not just myself, but on behalf of uh, uh, Michelle Wu, uh, Frank Hodak, and Dick Spinelli, our colleagues with whom I have the pleasure of putting together the uh, oral history of law librarianship for Hunt Online. Thank you for uh, taking your time this morning and the efforts to meet with me and prepare in advance a little bit so you could uh, make a good pre presentation, which you have, and tell us all about uh, what you and our profession are about. Uh, and thank you for that. Well, thank you for including me. <laughs>